please, let's get a warm Jimmy Expo welcome to Brad Wyman and Penn Gillette. Very attractive. <laughs> very, very attractive. You know, without your glasses, by God, you're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Penn, just to set the tone, okay. to get everybody right into it, okay. you know, uh, I thought everyone could get a little taste of what Director's Cut, Penn's new feature, uh, was, by the way, of your crowdfunding pitch feature. Sure. Sure. Can we run that? And then we'll uh, get into some conversation. Roll the clip. <laughs> Hi, I'm Penn Gillette. I'm more than half by way of Penn Gillette. I do a comedy magic show in Las Vegas. People love our magic show in Vegas. Children love our show. Children hug me at airports. I'm your mom's favorite atheist. I'd be nice to your mom. I wear glasses. I read. I even went on The Celebrity Apprentice to raise money for people with intellectual disabilities. I'm a big guy with a lot of crazy ideas, but I've tried so hard to be nice. Now, I'd like you to contribute money so I can make a movie. I don't need a lot of money by movie making standards, but I need more than I have myself. The movie I want to make is called Director's Cut. I've already written the script, it's really nutty, and I'm way proud of it. I've teamed up my favorite director of this century, Adam Rifkin. Now, Adam's done a lot of great movies, but the one that kills me is a movie he did called Woke. It's wonderful, terrifying, scary, smart, clever. He's directing this little video we're doing right here. <laughs> Director's Cut is like nothing you've ever seen. It'll be funny in places, but it's a scary intellectual mystery. We need to cast the perfect woman to play the lead. We're looking. She has to be great. Whomever we cast to play the lead will be the star of our movie and the star of the mystery movie within our mystery movie. You'll understand that as soon as you see it. And if you contribute and help us make this movie, You'll be the first to see it. And Adam and I have a lot of great rewards to get you to help make our movie. It's going to be nutty and scary. The kind of movie I want to see. No, I don't play the hero in Director's Cut. Director's Cut, I'm not the hero. In this movie, I'm the bad guy. Your mother isn't going to like me in director's cut. No, I'm not asking you to help us make this movie because I need a job. I have a job. I do a nice magic show in Vegas. And I'm not asking you to help us make this movie because I want to be a movie star. Look at me! I'm not going to be a movie star. <laughs> I want to do this movie because I'm so fucking sick of being a fucking nice fucking guy. <laughs> I don't want the bad guy in this movie.
always financed. Yeah, we get all the money. Uh, we have all the money we need. But that hasn't stopped us. Uh, no, uh, too much is always better than not enough. Should we pass the hat? So we were going to that. Should we close to that? Since we've stopped the campaign, right? We've made uh, almost twenty thousand dollars. And where would people find you to do that? Uh, we have a a, a site called uh, makepenbad.com, and and uh, people can go. You know, one of the things we've done is, uh, as you know very well, I mean, the reason that uh, uh, we ended up to fund anything is that the movie I talk about is being uh, really my, my favorite movie of the past 20 years, is a movie called Look. And you have to know Adam Rifkin's look because look is too, uh, too common a word to have to search for. But it's on iTunes and it's called Look and it's an uh, incredible movie and was produced by Brad. So uh, one of the reasons uh, we were involved with that is because Brad was at the time with Fun, with fun Anything and uh, we went and did that and we were done with the whole fundraising, uh, we just kind of, there's so much fulfillment to have to do, which is kind of a, that's the term they use for all the stuff they give the people. To Rewards. Give them. Rewards. Yeah. And um, there's so much of that to do. Uh, I mean, almost 10% of the budget for the movie will be uh, done with the rewards that people have given us. So we've just kept it going, uh, also because they've been fun, you know, I was afraid some of the rewards we're doing are you get to come backstage at Penn and Teller, we give you magic lessons, you get to come to my house for a movie night, you get to hang out and go to lunch. There's an awful lot of access. And I thought it would be creepy and bad <laughs> to open myself up like that. And uh, the real shock so far, I mean, the creeps may be in line, <laughs> but so far uh, it's been an absolute joy. I mean, it's, I mean it, it's a weird thing to say. I saw Mac King, who does a great magic show in town. If you get a chance to see it at, over at Harris, the best company magic show I've ever seen. And Mac King said, you listen to my podcast and hear me talking about how much I enjoyed meeting the people that funded the movie. And he said, so what's the real deal on that? He, he just assumed that I was lying on the podcast, <laughs> which is a fine assumption to make. But in this case, I happen to be telling the truth. Well, I think, you know, being new media, you know, and to just kind of segue into that, sure. this is not traditional financing. So, um, traditional financing, you probably go talk to studio heads and stuff. Well, we did. I mean, part of the thing that you, you, you want to do if you're going to crowdfund is, first of all, you want to fail. The other <laughs> one. Uh, I had this script kicking around for four or five years, the script the director's cut. And, uh, I've gone in and pitched it, and it always, the pitch always went very well, and uh, we even get to the next step with a few studios. Um, but you've only got about seven people right. uh, that you can talk to in Hollywood. Got to kiss any tokus? You got to kiss a lot of ass, yeah, an awful lot. But I mean, that's okay, you know, you, you're going to be working with people, it's okay to, uh, <laughs> to uh, and they're, you know, they're putting up a lot of money. So you know, who would you prefer? Well, what I, what I enjoy, you know, the nice thing about this is, that um, although you have to be nice in order to crowdfund to about 5,000 people, as opposed to about five people, if you did it the traditional way, the 5,000 people are actually good, sane, uh, nice people. <laughs> and the five people are uh, a dangerous, hateful, psychotic. So <laughs> it, uh, it, it balances off that way. And I don't know, I mean, who's asked you prefer to kiss. There may be some in here that enjoy dangerous, psychotic, uh, ass-kissing, uh, and God bless you, go to the studio with. But, um, but you love your fans. I do, I do. We, we also never had a real fear of our fans. I mean, if, uh, if you go to every show in Vegas, uh, at, after the show, Teller and I hang out and meet anyone that wants to meet us after the show. It's the equivalent of everybody having a backstage pass. And uh, no other show uh, does that. And uh, we did it not because it was a marketing idea, but because uh, we used to, you know, we're carny trash. So we used to work fair and stuff. There was, there was just no backstage. And when we were off Broadway, we just kind of continued meeting people after the show. And everyone assumed that as soon as we got to Broadway, we'd stop doing that, and we just kind of didn't. Right. And so it, it takes us we played London last time. We were playing a theater that was like uh, 
3,500 seats or maybe a bit more, and uh, it was filled up. And so the amount of time meeting people after the show was actually longer than the show itself. We actually crossed that threshold. We would do a 90 minute show and then an hour and 45 minutes afterwards talking to people. Wow. And we enjoy it. I mean, it turns out that if you're the kind of person that likes the Penn and Teller show, my chances of liking you go way up. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is so sad and cynical and heartbreaking the number of people I know in show business that show contempt for the very people that support them. And you've seen that too. Sure. And it's, uh, it, it's so sad. I mean, not, the sadness is not really for the people that they show contempt for, but the people who feel that contempt. What a horrible experience to go out and do a show every night for people that you don't respect and care for. Just, it's just so sad. So it makes you pen. <laughs> well, I don't know. And uh, so uh, crowd, crowdfunding became this, um, this really, really good idea. You know, I talked a lot to a uh, very good friend of Neil Gaiman, whose wife, uh, Amanda Palmer, did the big sure, crowdfunding yeah, thing for her record. And she said uh, that um, she gave out 30 rewards of going to people's homes and doing a concert on her ukulele just by herself in people's homes. And she said of the 30 shows she did, 28 of them weren't creepy at all. <laughs> so I'm going for that same race. <laughs> so I, um, we got a taste, but you know, tell us a little bit more of the inspiration and then also, um, you know, some of the different cool new media things that even have to do with the site and, 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 and crowdfunding and being on the set. I mean, Give us a taste a little bit. Okay. Well, you know, what, we, uh, what we talked about when we first started doing this was I have uh, a bunch of Twitter followers. Yeah. And what you end up doing is uh, my Twitter has always been done by me alone. And I um, just a tad short of 2 million because I know you're so big on my yeah, Twitter. About 1.9 or something. Yeah. But um, I always have done it myself. Right. And. Uh, there's a lot of marketing people that take over, you know, celebrity accounts and stuff, but I've always typed it in myself, and without really much direction or idea of what to use, uh, what I was trying to accomplish. It really was kind of what they designed it for. It really was just kind of typing things that popped into my head. So when it came time to do the uh, crowdfunding, I ended up burning a little bit of my Twitter. I, uh, because I was doing so much of contribute now, click here, do this, which you just have to do. There's no way around it. Uh, you are asking people for money, and you need to ask them for money, and there's no shame in that, but it well, does mean... when you give them back the stuff you were doing. Exactly. You what I'm talking about is... Put a ton of energy into more value no, we're, for we're any contribution. To, our goal so far, you know, one of the things we, we've done is... If people gave X amount of money, they get to come to the show and come backstage and get a magic lesson. And our goal in this is we're hoping that every single person that contributes uh, actually feels like they've gotten much more than they expected and uh, much more value than they wanted. And so far, we've done that very, very well. I mean, we've spent um, uh, much more time than the people expected. and. Uh, for the magic lesson, because I'm, I play, before the show, I play upright bass for about an hour. I'm not able to be back with it before the show, so I brought in um, the best magician in the world, uh, Johnny Thompson, who is um, <clears throat> the guy who mentors uh, Teller and I and has for a long time, and really writes with us and directs with us and really works on every move we do and uh, coaches us and everything we do in the show. I brought him back to teach people magic. And we had a guy last week who came in from uh, from Canada, and before the show, got a magic lesson with Johnny Thompson. And then uh, after the show, he met me and Teller, and uh, <laughs> son of a bitch fooled us. With <laughs> a trick that Johnny had taught us. So, uh, so it's an inventiveness in getting people to suck, but I was really thinking more about trying to lead you to the inventiveness of the movie and new media, and how like even the villain might appear. Yeah, the, yeah, well, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, 
one of the things that really inspired me, the idea of director's cut, very, very quickly so that I can then expand on it, is uh, I was fascinated by the idea that uh, we're all familiar with director's commentaries. And director's commentaries over movies always have this close mic'd personal feel that you really trust the director. And you get kind of lulled into this very personal space. So I thought that the idea of having a director's commentary that was done by someone who thought he was the director, but you found out as the movie went on, really wasn't the director, <laughs> or was actually just a criminal who kidnapped the lead actor. And that's you. That's me, yeah. Um, so I would do the whole director's commentary, and you realize about halfway through or a third of the way through that I'm not really the director, but I'm really the bad guy in the movie. And I had that idea, and I had it all written and all laid out, but one of the problems with the movie, one of the logical problems, was I had to get my bad guy onto the set. And my way of doing that was kind of like he's delivering pizza or delivering food or something. It was a pretty weak part of the movie. And then we started monkeying with the idea of crowdfunding it. I went back and rewrote the whole script because now uh, the logic of the script becomes better because the bad guy, me, Herbert, the, the character's name, um, gets on the set by crowdfunding. So he is the person <laughs> who crowdfunded the movie. Uh, as a reward. As, as, as a reward, he gets to be on the set and take pictures. And that allows him to go over to the person who has the FTP site and is putting up, uh, up all the uh, all the video for the day. He just uh, videos the guy typing in the password and that gives him all the outtakes of the movie so he can recut it the way he wants. That also gives him access to the police uniform that he steals and gives him access to the uh, lead woman of the movie who he kidnaps and then forces a knife point at his home to redo the lines the way he wants them to cut them back in the um, And then going with authenticity. Yeah, well, I want to, I'm going to throw that in. And then we got very near our goal on Fund Anything. We got very, very close. At the last second, we had uh, Herbert Blunt, who's the character, actually was the one who put the money in to put it over the top, and then wrote a message on our board that said, Adam, I can't wait to help you direct this movie. I can't wait to be part of funding it. I'm so happy I'm going to be there all the time working with this movie. You can follow Herbert on Twitter. Yeah, uh, he, he, he will be doing that. And you can also kind of tell what actresses we're talking to because he begins following them. Oh, no. It's <laughs> the instant that that happens. You know, one of the things I love about um, Blair Witch, that everybody loved about the Blair Witch Project, was the fact that it didn't happen in a movie theater, but really was the first movie to happen um, uh, in social media. And uh, I love that. I love that there was all that stuff going on. So I wanted to really uh, have um, director's cut really be that. So as the movie progresses and as we make it, you will see the bad guy sending in his own videos, doing his own vines, following people, making comments to Adam, and showing up on the set, and all of those things. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this movie will be bigger than just the 90 minutes that happens. Not, not, not bigger in terms of sales, but bigger in terms of the sloppiness of it and where, where it really happens. Well, I think that's brilliant. I mean, the inventiveness of, of you know, using everything that's available to you. Well, one of the things I did, and you might, you might like this, is one of the rewards you have on the crowdfunding site is you get to have a line in the movie, right? right? That's one of the big things that every film that crowdfunds does is you get to have a line in the movie. Well, our movie, because part of the subject is crowdfunding, and because Herbert the bad guy is on the set, filming them making the movie and cutting that into his movie while they make this other movie. The way we're doing the lines is that uh, Adam Rifkin stands up with a bullhorn uh, with all the other people and says, okay, who's here from the crowdfunding that has a line in the movie? And they raise their hand and line up and then Adam goes, okay, let's hear each of your lines. <laughs> Which don't appear anywhere else in the movie. So, uh, I just want to let you know, if you 
you want to get meta on my ass, I'm there to meet you. <laughs> um, so we, we've now talked about new media and how it's all working within the picture and, and all the different ways it's going to continue to promote and work it. Um, where are we? Uh, when are we going to make this thing? Uh, we are, right now, the money is in the, uh, the account and ready to go. We have hired uh, Dory Zuckerman, who's a... Uh, pre-production. Pre-production. I love him. We're in pre-production. We've hired... Uh, and by hired... the way, days after he's funded. Yeah. yeah. We started, we actually started uh, on paper pre-production before we were completely funded. Wow. We actually had, uh, we had uh, uh, Tevin and, uh, doing budgets and so on. And right now, one of the uh, rewards that everybody gets, even if they put ten dollars into the movie, is they get a copy of the script. Uh, as I say on the crowdfunding page, spoiler alert: it's the fucking script. <laughs> uh, not going to be a lot of surprises wow, if you read the script. Well, you know, five thousand people. Right, sure. You know. uh, but. Uh, Adam very much thinks, and I think he's right on this, Adam Rifkin, the real director of directors, not along the pretend director. Um, Adam thinks that uh, uh, we should have our lead actor, the woman that's going to be the star of the movie, in place before the script goes out to everybody. That makes sense. And he just thinks it's respectful to have her have the script first. So right now, I can't tell you who, but right now, two, uh, our top two choices for stars of this movie have the script. And uh, the preliminary stuff is that all the people around them, the managers and agents, really like it, and they're reading it over. And if either one of those two says yes, then we start as soon as she wants to. Uh, the nice thing about crowdfunding is our movie is a very low budget movie. We have, you know, one point one million dollars made this movie, which is a very very cheap movie. But then again, there's all sorts of expenses that you don't have when you're crowdfunding. Sure. The studio isn't there, you know, sucking off a lot of their, a, a lot of that money to keep their, to keep their, uh, their operation going. You don't have completion bonds, right. you know, any of those. Bank interest. No, none of that. Yeah. There's none of that to, uh, to pay for. So actually, a 1.1 million dollar movie should look like a two million dollar movie. I mean, it's personally why I fell in love with crowdfunding. I mean, you know, I've made many pictures at that budget and. Um, you know, the financing comes in immediately. You know, no papers, no documents. You know, it's in your bank as the transactions happen. And then you really have, you know, a real capital to work with and not all these fictional numbers. I was having this argument with Pat, Patty just the other day. Wait a second, the budget I signed for was this. You know, how can we only have that much to make it? And Patty did monster with me. Now, Penn, though, just to get off of Director of Second, I do want to talk about a little bit more new media. Um, sure. You have a, 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 a podcast every Sunday? Yeah, I do a thing called uh, Penn's Sunday School. And uh, I've been doing that for a while. It's on Adam Carolla's network. You know, however you define, you know, uh, nobody knows any of this stuff. It's being invented as we go. You know, crowdfunding is so new. Podcasts are fairly new. You know, really, really 10 years, even that stretching it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a really wonderful way. I just love how we're becoming completely unstuck in time. I mean, we have people tweet me that they listen to the podcast every week at the exact same time, and that's not the time that they do it, that I do it. It's just part of their schedule, works into their routine. And doing 90 minutes uh, a week, I mean, Adam Carolla does 90 minutes a day, and that's a whole different kind of thing. But, not but you don't do anything else. You don't write books, have a magic, little yeah, magic exactly. show every night. I'm not talking about the amount of work. I'm talking about um, the intellectual content. If you do once a week for 90 minutes, you can really kind of dig into a topic. It's oddly, doing a show every day, morning radio, you have to jump around a little more than you do uh, one week. You make sure. it more personal. And I've loved, I've loved doing that. And... Uh, you know, we have an expression that Glenn Adlock runs the whole Penatella operation. Shout out to Glenn wherever he is. <laughs> Amazing guy. We don't, uh, you know, he always says about selling the show, it's, it's not anything, it's everything. Yeah. And uh, you can't tell 
whether Twitter sells tickets to Penn and Teller or whether Director's Cut makes you know, informs Twitter or they go back and forth or Sunday you, School. You just you just kind of uh, you kind of do everything, you know. And I just finished. I did this movie called uh, Tim's Vermeer. Yeah. You know, a lot of the questions you get when you do crowdfunding is people will ask you. I think a very reasonable question, which is. Why, why don't you fund it yourself? Um, and the answer is, I mean, the blunt answer is, of course, I can't afford it. But there's a reason I can't afford it, which is the movie The Aristocrats, I funded with all my money. And the movie Tim's Vermeer, I funded with all my money. And um, we haven't gotten the money back on Tim's Vermeer yet. Well, as a motion picture producer, I can just tell anyone, you know, finance your movies. Yeah. You know, don't spend yeah. it because... Also, too, I think it's a great validation that people want to see this picture. Oh, it's yeah. not about ego, it's not about I want to make it. You've had, you know, literally the community and the crowd finance your movie. Yeah, and that's also I, part of it, um, to, to not disparage studios too much. Their gatekeeping function is a real and valid function. If you really can't get money for your movie any place, <laughs> then you probably shouldn't make your movie. Now, there's a little bit of an argument with that. Because I believe that movies that are great pitches are almost automatically not great movies. <laughs> uh, I think you really can get everything good out of your movie in a 10 minute pitch. Maybe what your movie should be is a 10 minute pitch. <laughs> um, that having been said, I think that uh, you should have a feeling that you can get other people on board before you uh, before you jump in big. So can I ask why? I mean, is this... <laughs> I mean, blogging, tweeting, you know, features, uh, your little magic show. I mean, is it, I mean, why, Penn? I mean, you know, you're, you're surely successful in magic, you know, and have a great career. Why are you using all these new medias? I mean, why? Uh, I, I don't think, uh, there isn't any um, sort of overall plan. There's no sort of, uh, I have... I had the success I wanted. I mean, all I all I wanted to do was do a do shows with Teller, and I've completely accomplished that. And there's no sort of um, we're all using all this to build up to some some big big plan. As a matter of fact, if we were a big corporation and we had that you know big sales meeting where we said, "Here's our plans for 2014," we don't have them. It would be like. What we'd like to do, everybody, is we'd like to do more shit than we want to do. Thank you! Uh, uh, we don't have any sort of uh, big goals. But all I ever wanted to do, you know, when I was, uh, I grew up in a, you know, dead factory town in Western Massachusetts. And all I ever wanted to do was have ideas and then give them to other people. Right. And uh, a magic show was a really, really good way to do that. And if that was all I had, I would be thrilled to pieces. But with other stuff there, I just love doing it. I mean, Twitter, uh, the idea that we're breaking down uh, this funnel uh, that, you know, in order to say something I thought was funny uh, in the 80s to have people hear it, I mean, people more than my friends, uh, I really had to go through all the gatekeepers of of Letterman or Stern or, sure. or Rolling Stone or People Magazine or all those. Even a publicist. Sure, you have to go through all of that. And uh, I mean, this has been the downfall of many people, so sure. <laughs> I like it, is I can, I can get an idea and write it on Twitter instantly and also get feedback. I may be the only one uh, that I know who has over a million Twitter followers that I believe, and I, I'm always afraid to make promises that aren't true, but I believe uh, I do not necessarily answer, but I read every single Twitter that's sent back to me. And if you, when I was doing Celebrity Apprentice and I was sequestered for five weeks, I probably missed a, you know several sure. hundred. But in general, but in you general, I do that. I, I put aside probably. Uh, Two hours a day so to read everything I get from people, and it's wonderful. It's like I like I like to talk to people who want to talk to me. So is it fair to say um, it's because it's there, 
Did you do uh, blogs and tweet? Yeah, it took me a long time. You know, I know some of the people that were involved in starting up Twitter, and they gave me. It's one of the reasons I don't have real Pendulette. I just have Pendulette because they gave me in the first list of Twitter addresses. They just gave me Pendulette, and for the first year, uh, I did not know how to use it. I did not understand it at all. Uh, but I just kind of kept toying with it a little bit, and then got a got a feel for it that I really enjoyed. And I just I've had a Vine account since the day they started, and just after watching Brian Koppelman do his wonderful screenwriting six second screenwriting te uh, lectures, uh, which are wonderful, I finally got a feel for how how Vine seems right for me. So just in the past two weeks, I've started doing Vines. You know, every other day or something. But you know, it took me a while to learn about uh, email. You know, I had my email. I had my email address in 1984, and at that time, if you had email, the only people you could write to were Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. You know, so you, write, hey Bill, what'd you have for breakfast? Oh, grapefruit. Me too. Um, so that, <laughs> because my first address, Steve Jobs got it for me. Right. And. Um, and so it was a very small group, and trying to tell people then what email was, why it was better for certain things than talking on the phone was very, very difficult. And then uh, when, as each, as each thing comes in, you know, texting and Twitter and Vine and Instagram podcast. and Snapchat and podcasts get, get uh, popular, you have to learn all over again what that kind of communication is. I mean, talking on the phone is very different than talking in person. Email is different from that. Text is different from that. And I just love learning about it. And when I first, uh, you know, nobody in this room had the experience of learning about email. You, you were all born with email around you. But um, that wasn't true for me. And uh, I got to learn about it. Yeah. Is well, that not true? Not true. true. No, not true. Well, I think that was... Some people almost my age or something. What, what I think was fascinating, and it's why I've converged, you know, to financing online, um, and I will continue to do so, is that I don't believe there's an excuse anymore, you know, for anything. If you want to make music, make music, put it out. If you want to make videos, put it out on YouTube. If you want to promote it, start tweeting and doing Facebook. You want a podcast, film it. None of these things cost really any money, to be honest. So if you are expressive and you are super creative, you know, we now live in a wondrous time where all these tools are available to us. I don't think, you know, a, a magician 60 years ago, you know, had a chance to do all of the different things that you're getting to do. Boy, it would be cool if a magician 60 years ago was tweeting. Wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do we have any time back there, Mike? Do we have any time left? I can't, because I can't read it, by the way. I think it says 1727. Seven, do you think Penn should take some uh, questions? Sure, take questions? Anybody want to uh, ask Penn a question? I think we can put the house lights up. There's a, a mic there. Uh, 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 Look at this. Absolutely no one No one there. Then we can just... We've answered every single question. <laughs> but wasn't it... Wasn't it uh, there's so many. There's a mic right there in the middle if you want to get up. Um, but you know, I think it was Cocteau that said uh, that uh, movies wouldn't really be uh, art until the uh, tools were as cheap as a pen and a pe uh, pencil and paper. And uh, we're, we're just coming really close to that. We're coming really close to being so able cool. to be able to uh, to do that and really make things. Of course, you know that there still is uh, a very, very good reason not to do your own film, or your own podcast, or your own music, and that is if you suck. <laughs> You'll find out. You'll find out, right? I, mean, I get a little worried when we, we do all this inspirational stuff, where we tell people, go out and create your art and everything else. No, no, there's some things you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> uh, go ahead, young lady. Hi there. I just want to thank you so much. It's been really exciting to hear you speak. And a couple things. First of all, my brother-in-law is a dead ringer for you, so if you ever need a stand-in pen, I'm sure Ted would do it. Yeah, you know, uh, so many. Any, you know, any big, fat, ugly guy with a square head. Uh, everybody tells that person they look just like me. And I always want to say, you know, they so much would rather be Brad Pitt looks alike. <laughs> so the other thing I want to tell
tell you is I just want to thank you because I have a son who for some reason got involved in Celebrity Apprentice. He was in high school. We watched it. We loved what you did. He just went to college. He's majoring in marketing. And I think a lot of it had to do with what you folks did on Celebrity Apprentice. And I watched um, how with your crowdfunding you use collaboration. And I thought about on The Apprentice how you bring in your partners. I just love that theme and, and just thank you so much. So. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Yeah. Please introduce yourself to everybody when you can. Yeah, I'm Barbara Rasconi, and I write the blog Wired PR Works. Fabulous. Oh, oh, sleep, you want to have it. And who are you? Hi, I'm Andrea Ball, and uh, I am co author of Facebook Marketing All in One for Dummies. I just, I just had a question about how do you know if your art sucks? Yeah, you know, that's, I've just been having this, uh, this argument with. Uh, with Brian Koppelman. Um, Who's Brian Koppelman? Brian Koppelman wrote Rounders and, and uh, uh, Ocean's Eleven, 12, 13, all those things. He's a fabulous screenwriter. He's been doing all this inspirational stuff, telling people, you know, go out and, and do your art. And I said, you know, unless, it's, you, know, unless you suck. Uh, Charles Bukowski, you know, the great poet and writer, said that the best service you could do to anyone who was going into the arts was to discourage them. Tell them they had no talent, they were awful, and they should quit. Because anybody you told that to who would quit because of what you said should not be in the arts. So uh, I think there's an argument, uh, although I'm not the one who's willing to do it, there's an argument that making it difficult is, a, uh, is an okay thing. I mean, you really, if you have to decide if you want to be a writer, you probably shouldn't be a writer. If you're not getting up every day and writing for two hours, just automatically on your own, with nobody, uh, with, with no sort of uh, gun to your head, and no sort of promises to yourself, you probably shouldn't be doing it. I mean, everybody that I know that that writes uh, doesn't really have a choice. I mean, if I had another job, I would still be writing the same amount of writing. Thank you. Hi, my name is James. Uncomfortably sodgy. I have two questions because I'm a greedy jerk. Uh, first is specifically for Penn. Being that in the past on your podcast you talked about being extremely scared of horror movies, what made you decide to do a horror movie? And then for both of you, uh, in terms of crowdfunding, how are you going to remain, I guess, legally accountable for the funds that they were all used appropriately? And just in terms of background on the accounting on that sort of stuff, what do you do to ensure to people that the money's going to go to stuff? Having to do with the movie directly rather than just you know paying a production assistant to go get coffee. Yeah, well, you. one of the things you will is you'll pay a production assistant to go get coffee. I mean, uh, you're, not, you're not trying to protect against that. That's that's one of the things. That's one of the things that happens in, in making a movie. You, you do need production assistants, and they really should be paid. Uh, I'm making a horror movie because you know uh, I was terrified by any sort of slightly scary movie, but I realized that so much uh, of the intellectual ideas I was interested in were happening in horror movies that I had to get over that. Uh, George Romero's own description of Night of the Living Dead uh, does not use the word zombies. His description of the movie is, it's a movie about what happens to America when a truly radical political system takes over. That was his description of it. Uh, Dawn of the Dead, George Romero's movie, although James Gunn did a wonderful version after Romero's original Dawn of the Dead, which is my favorite movie, I like because it, it, it deals with um, the importance of society and interaction with people you don't know personally, how important that is, and how paradise cannot exist, even the material wealth, friendship, sex, and love, you still need society around you. That idea for a movie. And I think that because horror movies and also um, graphic novels and so on deal with such big subjects, life and death and fear and terror, they allow the intellectual to hitchhike along with it. And I wasn't willing to not have that. And, and the ideas of Director's Cut are much more important to me than the scares. Kind of like in our magic show, the idea behind the tricks may be more important than the tricks, but we still try to do tricks that are really good. In answer to the accountability... I'll, I'll finish that one off for you, okay. and we'll get to the next question. This is a direct-to-consumer contract. 
And if you don't act like Penn's Act, which is to overcompensate and make your consumer, the person that's bought the reward, think they've gotten more than they bargained for, then you won't be crowdfunding again. So that's my answer. Yeah, and also, the, in kind of a deeper answer on the accounting, there's a lot of stuff on the crowdfunding that, that nobody knows. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of questions about... I learned from Emily. Sales tax. <laughs> sales tax and and all sorts of taxing interstate stuff that just just nobody knows yet they, you know, you're, you're kind of creating this new thing so you know what I'm hopeful of is that we can make the 5,000 people who've helped me make this movie really really happy and try to uh, pay all our taxes and do all of that and, make it a movie. and hope that with a good movie at the end of that that that's that that's, uh, that's a reward and we can do it again. I mean, all of this stuff, all of the stuff we do in our lives, once you've gone beyond just creating food, you know, um, what you do is you're just playing pinball. If you do it well, you get to do it again. Exactly. Um, next, please introduce yourself to Hi, I'm Charles from Success Freaks. And first off, I'm Success say, Freaks. Yes, sir, Success Freaks. First off, I wanted to say, uh, Poon Teller's Bullshit was an amazing show. Thank you. Well, 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 <laughs> Coming up in a Southern Baptist Church home, that really changed the way I saw the world a lot. Uh, secondly, we're all about, obviously, chasing success, uh, discovering your dream, finding it, catching it, living it, success freaks. My co-host and partner is in the Renaissance world. He's my teller, if you will. Uh, we get that a lot because he's short and tall. But we know you came from the Renaissance. Tell us five care. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you're no longer Keller, sir. You're like four foot. That's okay. <laughs> Coming from the Renaissance Festival world, was there a moment where you almost gave up on your craft, knowing that that's a hard world to be in, not knowing where you'd be successful today? Is there a story where you almost gave up and you're not the Gillette that you are now? I'm so sorry that I don't have that story. Um, I, uh, when I was doing terribly, uh, I thought I was doing fine. Um, <laughs> my, my, my dad, my dad was a jail guard, you know, and he he worked in one of the most um, heart crushing jobs you can have, being a jail guard, and then came home to his family and got all his joy from his family and never once complained about his work. It wasn't until I was an adult that I realized how awful this job must have been. And when I was working as a street juggler, I was supporting myself and getting some joy from my job. Uh, I consider that to be um, success. And anything beyond that is, is wonderful, but it's incredible that we live in a world and in a century where we can get some joy from our jobs. A uh, hundred years ago, that just plain wasn't true. That was really, really rare. And it's still rarer than it should be, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty beautiful thing. I'm not one to quote Neil Simon, but <laughs> Neil Simon said that the difference between making zero a week doing what you love and making $200 a week doing what you love is enormous. And after that, you don't just, you don't notice the zeros nearly as much. So I think that my level of what I consider success is probably so much lower than other people's. I considered myself a success the instant I was eating uh, and supporting myself doing what I love. Even though the first time I was doing that I was living on the streets and actually homeless, I was still eating and doing shows and I just loved it. And I was thrilled to pieces. One of the problems we hit Broadway was that a lot of the interviewers would talk to us about, let's talk about the, the, the horrible conditions you went in before you made it big off Broadway, and tell her that we just always answer, no, well, we were wicked happy. <laughs> you know, we kind of we bummed their shit, because uh, when we were doing Renaissance festivals, I was having a fabulous time. And when we were carting trash, we had a fabulous time. And playing 100 seat theaters that had 50 people in them were fabulous. We were creating stuff, and people were applauding for it. And in my heart, I can't really tell the difference.
between 200 people applauding and laughing on a street situation, a Renaissance festival, and 200 people applauding and laughing on Letterman. I know intellectually that the Letterman people may represent a million, but in my heart I can't tell the difference. So, no, there was no time I wanted to give it up because I have no other skills. If I were to, <laughs> if I were to do show business, I'd just go to jail. <laughs> Who's next? Dr. Mark Vaughn of the Auburn Medical Group podcast and YouTube channel. I have to thank you for your work on, uh, I found it on YouTube, on telling people about the truth of vaccinations and how they work and that we need to look at the numbers and what happens when you look at uh, groups that are compared against each other, what the truth is. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, thank you. I, I, uh, on, the, on the bullshit show, the show that I had to push for the hardest was to do the, uh, the vaccine show. And it's a complicated thing to say because bullshit, the idea was, was always, we always had a state of everything in the negative. It was the bullshit of the anti-vaccination people. And I had to argue with Showtime forever and insist that we'd be able to make that sexy and funny. And that's why when we give the real medical information in the middle, it's delivered by a top sport. <laughs> but I did write it. <laughs> but thank you. The, thank the you. vaccination show is my favorite of, of all whatever it was, 90 bullshit shows. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Alan Martindale. I'm a podcaster and a student filmmaker. Um, my question is, it really can apply to both of you, but it's particularly for Brad. Uh, you know, you seem to have really embraced social media and the crowdfunding and whatnot. How do you think the rest of, of traditional Hollywood, are they adapting to, to what's going on in social media and the different opportunities? Well, Hollywood is always the last to get it. In fact, you know, I don't even know if they've still uh, embraced digital technology yet. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I think, you know, everybody is looking for uh, new and exciting alternatives for financing. And I do believe, truly, which is why I do what I do, that at some point every film will have some aspect of crowdfunding to it for the social engagement, for the ability to have direct communication. Just like when people that had films you know, refused and I was there to put a Facebook page up for their film or a Twitter account for their you know, film, they were against it in Hollywood. And now I don't think there's probably a film out there that doesn't have both. Hi, Nika Nord with the Internet Association based in Washington, D.C. Um, I have a question for Penn Jillette. With technology being integrated in various industries and really unexpected ways and startups kind of coming out with all these awesome new ideas, do you have any plans to further integrate new media into your shows, like coming out with an app or a new magic trick? Maybe make my text messages disappear? We, we have done it. It's interesting. There's a Penn & Teller app with a uh, really, really good card trick. Um, when, we, when we put it out, we didn't do, uh, we didn't put a lot of muscle behind it. We had other stuff going on then, it was right, we were launching a TV show and stuff, so we didn't do a great deal of support for it, and it wasn't wildly successful uh, as an app. It didn't sell a zillion, but it's really successful as a trick. Um, and it really fools the shit out of the people, so yes. We did, we did do an app like that. Uh, you don't want to do technology in a magic show um, live. Uh, magic used to be on the forefront of science. They would always do stuff with, I mean, they were the first to do stuff with ether. Uh, electromagnets were first done, of course, movies were first done by magicians and shown as part of magic shows. But now people are so tech savvy that we have never been able, even for a second, to get ahead of the audience. There's nothing that we know about that the whole audience doesn't also know. So when it comes to doing a magic show live, uh, it's better to stay away from technology and go with good old fashioned lying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So just a couple more here. Three more questions there. Hi guys, thank you for being here and uh, sharing some time with us. My name is Chris Kern and my podcast show is called Social media unscrambled. 
And uh, I had a car. I want you to. You do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Pat, I wanted to ask you to uh, predict the future of social media. Do you have any ideas or opinions of what the future is going to bring? It's going to get better. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, no. What? If I had any of the ideas, I would. You know, I'd be doing them. I'm a, I'm a follower of this. Uh, you're not going to get you're not going to get new breakthrough ideas on social media from someone like me. Uh, we we know the kinds of people that come up with that stuff, and uh, they'll keep they'll keep doing it. And you know the the one thing that you know bullshit preached over and over again, and I talk about on my podcast, is that you know two things are almost always true. One is the world keeps getting better, and two is people just keep thinking it's getting worse. Um, we're getting better on every front, and the stuff we're doing now, I mean, um, my, my children are, are seven and eight, and I am, uh, I, I'm amazed to just think that they won't be dealing with Twitter or Facebook or anything we have now, but there'll be all sorts of better things. And uh, it all has to do with it comes down to people, the fact that we can communicate instantly with people all over the world and the fact that we can share our hearts with people who aren't in the same room with us is just, it's beyond any wild utopian fantasy that any writer or creator has ever had in history. It's all good and it's going to get better. <laughs> Thank you guys. Two more. Hey Ben, I'm J.P. Stone Street, the Smart Energized Entrepreneur Podcast. I saw your show last time I was in Vegas, fantastic. I told everybody about it, like recounting all the tricks and stuff. I was completely amazed. Uh, one, the question I had is, you know, my mom always said, never talk about religion or politics. And you huh. talk about both. Man, I wish you told me that. <laughs> so my question is... Fuck, things have gone so much smoother. <laughs> so my question is, did you do that from the beginning, or did you wait till you had the big stage before you started speaking your voice on this topic? I have always felt that the job of a entertainer, performer, artist, whoever you want to do it, as Allen Ginsberg said about the poet, is to stand naked on stage. I believe you're supposed to speak from your heart. And I think that that's very good advice your mother gave you, like most of the other advice she gave you. Uh, very good advice for Thanksgiving dinner with the relatives and very good advice for backyard barbecues. But I think if you've decided to go into communication, um, your job is to not hold very much back. I hold stuff back a little bit on my family. I hold back on how the tricks are done because that's part of my job. Or I hold back on some of the tricks. Um, but I believe that religion and politics are really, really, really important. And I believe the best way to find out you're wrong is to say what you believe to as many people as possible. Uh, a lot of things I've been corrected on, I would not have been corrected on if I didn't shoot my mouth off. And I think the best way to find out if how what you believe holds up is to, is to hold it up for, for scrutiny. There's a great book uh, by Jonathan Rauch, which is called um, uh, Kindly Inquisitors, that really talks very much about uh, taking the marketplace of ideas uh, into the 21st century. And I, so I think it's very important to talk about religion and politics because they matter. And the answer to the actual question is, I always have. That, that isn't a new thing at all. Okay. Thank you. One final question. I, I can't believe I'm the first person to say this, but I'm so excited to be making a movie with you. <laughs> and I am a super pimp at Wow Is Me. And uh, my, actually it wasn't a question, I just wanted to say you have a heavy influence on my son who figured out how to hack the parental controls on my Tito so he could watch your show. Thank you. So thank you for being such a good influence. Well, thank you for making I want to thank Penn Gillette for uh, uh, giving us an Media. We're going to touch them all, and I am really was excited to just be a small part of helping your, uh, your pitching at a podcast.